Vanessa. Alright, ready? Tell us when to go. Whenever. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Vanessa. Happy birthday to you. We're in Afghanistan. Woo! There we go. This is where we fire off shots in the air. Yeah. 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 Hey, can we real quick? Can go? To your right, starting off at your right, you got... I'm Sean. Hey. I'm Will. Matt. Hey. Casey. Kevin. Cameron. Jake. John. I'm Sully. Happy birthday, Vanessa. For a while, it was kind of like a joke throughout our team that nobody wanted to patrol next to me because on multiple occasions, I was, like, the guys standing to my left or right would get shot. So people before were like, no, you know what, you go with next to Smith. Like, people would get shot next to him. Like, let's, like, you know, think smart here. I'm like, come on, guys. Like, we fuck. Do you want to patrol next to me? Are you guys my friends? Look at you or the camera? Just... Just act naturally. Right. Me and my wife will be married seven years in April. Um, and then my daughter is three years old and my other daughter is turning one this month. So, yeah, I'm, I'm originally from California and raised there, all my schooling there. Um, enlisted in the military, stationed there. Like, you know, California is my home. What do I introduce myself as? Whatever you want. Well, film student? Yeah. Veteran? Yeah. How about just Logan? I'm Logan. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, why did you want to join the Marines? Or uh, did you want to join the Marines? Oh, that's a tough question. I don't even know the answer to that, to be honest with you. Um, I guess I was called thousands of years from all the different cultures there's always been a group of people that's always been set apart there's the warrior class when you're in the middle like they drill things in your head too, get you all pumped up ready to go and you're around your buddies and you're all thinking the same thing so yeah you get all excited and I was it was Kevin Kevin Matt Smith um, Corey Jordan, I think there were five of us. And so we made the decision, me and my friends, we changed battalions. We went from 2-5 over to 3-5 and because we knew they were going to Afghanistan. And pretty much all of us, I think, felt we needed to like prove ourselves and just kind of like get our stripes, you know. So I, all I wanted to do was get, pretty much get into a gunfight right away. And I was like, there's no way I'm signing up in the Marine Corps out of all the military branches. I was like, I'm not. You know, I got to go to some combat zone. I kind of 
kind of wanted to experience war, I guess. When uh, we came over from 2-5, and we were only like four or five months before the deployment, and these guys have been training together for about a year, they had deployed together, and I didn't know how we were going to fit in, if they were going to be pissed off that we were coming into their platoon. They were glad to have us, and, you know, we, right off the bat, we were, we were pretty close with everybody there, and it was one of those group of men that you become really close with. Like the chemistry that we all had, like it just clicked. I mean, we had guys come from the East Coast and Hawaii because it was just a bunch of snipers who wanted to go to Afghanistan. And I think that mentality bonded us together. Then what really hit me was, it was about a week before deployment was the battalion commander did a gear inspection of the whole battalion. And at first it's like, dude, this is going to take like three years, you know, for this guy to get through all this. It's going to take forever. So he's coming around and he's really not checking. He knows the Marines have their gear. He just wants to look at them and kind of, when he looked at me and shook my hand and asked me if I was ready to go, that's where it really hit me because I was like, wow, like this guy's looking me in the eye and he's telling me, he's like, dude, we're going over. I could just feel it. He's like, we're going over to, there's gonna be some bad shit going down over here, you know? I thought it was going to be easy, you know, like video games or movies. It wasn't. We took a lot of casualties right away. I think we took, it was nine and either two or four days or something awful like that. And it was, that was right at the beginning of, the deployment and then experiencing that off the bat you knew or you had the feeling that that could be like that the whole time and there was a possibility that there wouldn't be very many people going home. Hi Amanda, just got back from patrol. I'm going to go through my gear real quick for you and your brothers. Right here I have eight magazines with 5.56 five, and then I carry my two tourniquets so I can grab them out really quick if I need to. Got two frags, got my pig sticker, then I got my uh, medical shears for cutting off sleeves and uh, pant legs for when we have to put tourniquets on to get the wounds. Got a smoke here usually, but I just threw it today on today's patrol, so it's not there right here. I have my calm, my calm, just stick this in my ear right here, and then I just talk normally, and I just gotta press a little button down here, and that way they don't see me like. Don't really look important or anything. Then right here, I got my laser range finders. I my camel back right here. And it has my emergency pistol in it. Then right here is my IFAC with all my medical supplies in it. I think you got shot at your first patrol, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't even go on patrol yet. We were driving into the base, and the guy on the turret, the gun on top of the trucks and stuff. He was just standing up, and the guy from the other battalion was like, hey, you know, we've had some sniper fire here, so you might want to sit down. And he sits down. As we're going up the hill, just ding, just a round hits right on the shield where he was at. And we're like, oh, crap, you know, like we're already getting shot at. I think we were at the base. We landed, like, in the middle of the night. And then the next day, we were, like, bullshitting with, like, the British guys, just, like, hanging out. And... I just remember seeing a bullet like right in between the two like hooches, like the little fortified like living areas that we had, like right in the middle of the alley to skip on the ground. The first day, the first 24 hour period I was there, bullets came in the fob. The yeah, base. yeah, I forgot bullets about that. Bullets came in yeah. the base of the first 24 hours. That was before we even knew where we were going. We are just, it was dusk, smoking a cigarette and... The bullet comes ding, ding, down. Ding. You're like, that just happened. Yeah, like... And everybody in our section, all the snipers, just ran straight to our base or right to our hooch, grabbed all of our gear and ran straight up to the wall. It's like, where's my gun? Where's <laughs> yeah. my gun? What do we do? Yeah. That's when it hit real for me. And I was like, okay, you know, they're out there. You know. Literally, our, our first um, mission 
it was our first time going out the wire. Um, we left like really, really early in the morning, like zero three or zero four. And we were kind of, we were in this cornfield and we saw the two like team leaders, I guess you would say, of that like insurgent group. And they had like their AKs and their radios and they were pointing like where they were gonna set up and stuff. And so we initiated contact and took out the two team leaders. Um, and then it just all hell broke loose. Up. And then with the enemy on that point, they started maneuvering around us and uh, just like getting us into a 180. And uh, that's when I knew like, this is gonna be a whole different ball game. I mean, it's the very first day, four hours into the day and you're already two clicks away from any help and you're getting cut off and sent around and moved on by the enemy at seven in the morning and there's nothing you could do about it. Right here is the uh, M40 sniper rifle with a suppressor. Uh, this is what I got my first two kills on. It's at uh, 308 meters and they were running from left to right. Uh, well, for, for me they were running left to right. So I got my first two kills on. Didn't even know it hit him. It was pretty funny. Next is my rifle. I got a Knight's Armament Suppressor on it, 9th Magazine, and then a V4 Buttstock. Usually carry 9 mags because uh, in the past couple firefights we've been going through 5 to 6 mags, so it's always good to have 3 extra. And right here. You have the Mark 11 sniper rifle, it's a semi-automatic 20 round magazine, uh, it's pretty much like an M16, only uh, shoots 762, it's just as accurate as the 40, and uh, you can take off the suppressor, and it helps it make it look like an M16 when it's on patrol. Alright, I hope you enjoyed that, I uh, love you. I would say it. It's a roller coaster ride, kind of. You get there and you're all amped up, you know, you're excited. Mm -hmm. And then you start, stuff starts happening. You're like, wow, this is real, you know? And like you said, no day was the same. Yeah. You had your good ones and you had your good or bad ones and you just roll with it. How it was working is we were clearing out a section of the city and the IEDs were, the whole place was just littered with them. And uh, I was maybe 200 meters behind uh, Kevin's element. So literally, we'd go into a compound, we'd find two or three, dispose of them, move up to the next compound, four of them were in there, you know? It was a very slow process of doing this. <laughs> uh, a known sharpshooter in that area, um, and so we were all pretty nervous going in there. Uh, we had had a couple uh, precision shots on some machine gunners on rooftops that came very close to hitting people. And we moved up, and I was at the big, like in the forward of the element, and we get up on top of the roof of this next compound, and I'm looking down into the next one, and there's a dog in there. And this dog is just going nuts, barking at us. And we were talking, and we're like, okay, you know, we might have to put this dog down so we could send our bomb dog in to sniff around, you know. And uh, so we're in an overwatch position, and we hear a single shot. So I'm up there, and I'm like, all right, yep, all right, game plan, got it. And I'm turning around to talk to the squad leader, to tell him what we're going to do, and boom, just, just like that. And, like, all of a sudden on the radio, we hear... Routine gunshot to the head. And then they said his kill number. And like, I just felt like everything come out of me because in my mind, he'd been shot in the face and died. And I jumped right off and I went to the squad leader. I said, we're gonna go get him. 
my team leader crawls up to me. And he's like, dude, you just got shot in the head, you know? And I'm like, I'm like am I bleeding? And he's like, he checks me out. I was like, just a little bit, but, you know, you're talking to me. And I was just, get me out of here, dude. Like, just, I want to get out of here. And I grabbed me and uh, Mark Hammett. I said, we're going to go get Kevin. And then right after I said that, they're like, no, no, he's fine. Don't worry. It didn't puncture, like, it just scraped his helmet. We're like, are you fucking kidding me? So we go back down the stairs, and we're sitting down there, and the corpsman comes up, and he's like, his little flashlight checking me out and everything. And he's like, you're good, man. And he's like, do you need anything? I was like, can I smoke a cigarette? And he's like, I don't see why not. So, yeah, they gave me a cigarette. So we go over there, and I don't know what to think. I'm still, like, my, you know, adrenaline's pumping. I'm, like, terrified. And I'm happy because he's not dead. And we get over there. And he comes into this compound. We meet in this compound. He gives me a smile. I was like, fuck, dude. And I, I pop my helmet off and, like, I look at it. And, like, all the padding's blown out inside. And I'm like, what is all this stuff? So this is a helmet I was wearing while I got shot. And you can see that's the entrance where it obviously went in and it traced, let's see if we can get a good view, traced around on the inside of the Kevlar and then tried to poke itself out through here, but it, it just, it got stopped within. And you can see in the pads how it ripped through all the pads as well. And then I looked over at Mark and he's as white as a ghost. And like, if I would have looked at him at the same time, I would have thought that Mark was the guy who got shot in the head because he was so much more concerned about it. Kevin was just dazed and confused. He wanted to get the fuck out of there. But just like the emotion that, you know, Mark was showing, like true emotion, like one of his best friends almost died. And that's one of the things that I struggle with the most is because I feel I'm better than that. I should have never put myself in that situation. I should have never gave him the opportunity to even take a shot at me. And that was like such a strong like impact on me. Cause I just wanted to go shoot everyone I fucking saw. And then I remember the doctor telling me, so I have some advice for you. And if you follow it, he's like, I guarantee you'll make it out of here. And I was like, all right, what's the advice? Don't get shot again and don't step on any IEDs. And I was like, well, Go figure, buddy, you know? I've already got that down. When Kevin got shot, I found out so much later that it was just, I was so conditioned to being used to hearing things like that. Um, when I heard that Kevin got shot, it was, Kevin got shot, but he's okay. So it was like, oh, you know. And it was something that I needed to ask him about later when I saw him, but it was just, it was standard. It was typical to hear that somebody got shot by then. You know, just boom, it just happened. And I was like, I got super lucky. And then like thinking those next couple of days, I was like, dude, like, definitely got a second chance, you know, got to push the restart button kind of. And then it was like, that's, that's when I was, completely changed. I was like, dude, it's it's on, you know? And it's kind of a fight every single day just to make sure you get out of there, you know? Alright, get across. Let's go. 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 let us go as scared me as just walking around. Some of the scariest patrols I went on, I never even took, got shot at. And I remember I would wake up and be like, I would look at my legs and be like, well, it's been a wild ride, but might not come, might not be walking back into base tonight. I mean, those first three months were fucking miserable. Because every time a log train came in to resupply us, like, a convoy to give us more supplies. Every time those came in, they were just bringing more bad news. You know, somebody's friend either died or, you know, 
got both his legs blown off. And it just, you could see the emotional toll it took on us. Those first three to four months was just every day something was going on. And it was just, it was kind of demoralizing. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa, I'm your dad. Or, yeah. And uh, I'm here in Afghanistan. And I want you to know I miss you and I love you. I want you to have a good first birthday. And I love your mom very much. Amanda, I love you a lot. I want to show you my hair because I got chewed out today. So I have to get a haircut. It's just awesome. That is, it's amazing. All right. Um, I want you to know I'm going to come home safe when we're uh, fighting hard and uh, yeah, we're not showing any mercy so we're going to make sure we all come back home alive and safe with all our parts and know that the Lord is with us and that he's protecting us and guiding us and uh, just, just blessing us a lot. He's, he's kept us pretty safe in some hairy situations. And so there's like this small gap between the tree I was with, like on, and then like where I was, you know, because I was trying to stay behind it. And this like PKM or AK burst just ripped us like right up into us. And we're in a, a tight alley. There's like 13 of us in a tight alley. And we, the only way we could do was a ranger file, which is just one man after the other, like a long line. And uh, the round like hit the tree bark and like sprayed my face with the tree bark. I turned to shoot and there were three guys in front of me so I like I, my fields of fire were cut off so I started running back and I remember as I was running back the dirt was like every step I took a bullet would fall on my foot. And like went right I mean it was like a gap like that big in between my head and this tree and the round like went right in there and it ripped up the front of the tree and it ripped up Matt's whole side. I mean that's a, Honestly, that's the definition of like perfect situation with an automatic weapon to have that many targets lined up in that small of a space that close and only one guy got hit inside sappy plate it doesn't it's like it's almost impossible and like it just got rocked back and we're just sitting there in this like little ditch and we were just laughing like holy crap you know like Whoa, whoa, you know, it's just like kind of surreal feeling. There were times when I was like someone was moving bullets around with their hands because there was no way in hell that didn't hit me. I think what got us through it the most was our ability to like laugh at the situation. <laughs> One who fought in church. Because <laughs> when you're put in that se like severe of a circumstance, you can either like let it cripple you, or you can just make fun of it, and you know, if you make fun of it, kind of disarms the like the danger of it. So that was pretty much how we got through it. Just like making a joke out of it and kind of becoming a little cynical about the whole deployment. I think the way that we'll do laundry is shirts. Then britches, then underwear. Are we gonna separate colors? And then from... socks, and then Logan socks. Logan socks will always be last. <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> you can throw all your other luck. I'll even do your your britches and your shirts for you, but but your socks, <laughs> your socks go last. I've worn a pair of socks for a week that came off not smelling that bad. Earlier he was I don't know, he got his front tooth knocked out. So he had a fake one in, and oh yeah, I want to say it was in within the first month of deployment, and he's well, I, the one before we even got into country, or like when we were get, getting ready to get on the helo to go. Remember that? Like this thing would just like he'd take it out, and he would keep it. There's this little compartment in the butt stock of our gun, and he would keep its tooth in there. And right, we're like, get, we're like getting ready to get on the helo and like to go to the main base. We're like, oh, right, we okay, here we go, you know. And they're like, chopper's like 10 minutes out, you know. And we're like, all right, like loading up. He's like, my tooth fell out. So and we're the, sitting in the rocks. We're in gravel. 
everything looks like a tooth. Everyone's got their i or not their iPhones, but their iPods. Like yeah, and it's dark, so we're down here. I don't know how we found that damn tooth before the chopper got there. Like if we heard that someone um, was an amputee from an ID, the first question we would ask is, did he get to keep his nuts? Because we really didn't want to deal with the fact that a guy just lost his legs. We wanted to make like, okay, if he keeps his nuts, at least he's you know still a man, still gets to you know have some fun. So as long as the guy got to keep his nuts, that's that's how we pretty much look at it. So he's got it there, but then within a month in deployment, we get into contact, and he's screaming orders out, and he just screams his tooth, just <laughs> flies right out. So we're like starting to bound back, you know, to get out of the the danger area. And he's just sitting there patting the ground, like <laughs> looking for his tooth. And we're like, we got to go. Like people are shooting at us. He's like, my tooth, my tooth. I'm like, leave it, dude. Like we'll get you another one. And we never did, you know, but so with another six months, he had to walk around with Too a tooth close. missing. <laughs> like should have kept it in your butt stock, dude. And we were so short on bodies that we were begging the Marine Corps to send us Marines to help us. We had 25 KIA plus over 200 wounded. We're not going to let the enemy see that we're taken down easily. We're going to let them know that America is here. If we're, you know, we're going to chew bubble gum and kick ass, and we're all out of bubble gum. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Morning, Amanda. Uh, and Vanessa. This is Sangin. And this is PB Fires. This is where we're staying. It's the northern, most northern part of Sangin. This is Abate's room. It's kind of a uh, dark in there because we don't have power. If you could have anybody, living or dead, past or present, fictional, non-fictional, jump out of a birthday cake <laughs> on your next birthday, who would it be? Abate, Matthew, Abate. Why is that? Because uh, he's the greatest man I've ever known and is, I don't think there is any other person alive that would instantly touch somebody's life like he did. Like even if you knew him for like thirty seconds, within that thirty seconds of meeting him, you'd feel like he was your best friend already. You know. The first time I met him uh, was when we went to go like interview with three five to see if they would take us, and he's just walking out of the of the shack. The 53 pound fucking kettlebell. I was like, what's up, brother? Like, welcome to the platoon, man. Like, just like, that was the kind of guy he was. Like, everybody wanted to be around him. Uh, he was an alpha. He was that man that women wanted to be with him, men wanted to be him. He was that guy that could change the outlook of anything. I mean, like, you think of like the perfect Marine, like, that was it. Just tall, built like a brick shit house. Fucking phenomenal, whatever he did. He was just kind of like our, the heart and soul of our platoon. Because people would come back, like our platoon sergeant would come back, and he would try to recreate the story the way Abate said. It's like, I shot the guy, and his body was flapping like this. It was hella sick. And just, I mean, everything about him, I heard he would just, they'd be in the middle of a gunfight, and he would just run out to the middle of the open, just like, Ch -ch -ch -ch. It's got to keep blazing, brother. I mean, I'm sure the stories are skewed from what actually happened. I'm sure the real stories are much cooler than that. Yeah, he was like super stoked and just like ready to go blaze. Yeah, go be with his brothers. 
and he completely redefined uh, that battle space that we were in. And by the time it was done, had rallied, you know, hundreds of men. Like, I ran into a guy at the fucking gym the other day, and I was wearing a 3-5 shirt, and he happened to be in 3-5. He was actually in Lima Company. And the first thing he said to me, he was like, did you know Abate? I was like, yeah, dude. Like, I'm in Chicago, two years later, some fucking random guy sees a 3-5 shirt, he's like, do you know Abate? I'm like, yeah. This is, dude, I don't have this pick. This is um, the day that you all came for uh, Matt's um, remembrance ceremony. And uh, it was the first time we had all seen each other the whole deployment. <laughs> it was a good, good time. Uh, yeah, well, it was fucking bullshit because you guys were there for like, I don't know, nine hours and like, get the hell out of here. But uh, it was amazing to, first of all, walking into Banshee 3's lair, as it were. It was like the happiest moment of my life. Like seeing you and seeing, you know, Sugarwood and if anything would happen to that person, you know, you'd just be crushed. And so seeing you guys still alive and, and walking around, you know, like, just gave me so much peace to like visually see you and, and embrace you and hug you and hold you and and talk to you and and you know smoke a cigarette with you. We got to see each other for the first time in many months, and that was the first time the twenty nine of us were together, and like you just really saw these relationships come back together and how much these people genuinely cared about each other. And then walking in and seeing them, and like it was like a family reunion, and uh, it was just amazing to see them at first. And then, I mean, I had more closer ties with your section, and then finally when your section came in, it was like a fucking party. You know, I remember I have uh, videos of us just sitting around that little fire pit. For some reason, there's a fucking dog. I remember the thing smelled like shit, but uh, just being with everybody. It was a big morale booster, and it sucked when they like ripped you guys out of there. And then to talk about all the memories of Matt, you know, together, and everybody's laughing, and that it wasn't like a depressing, Matt's dead, we all mourned. Instead, we all mourned and like, uh, dude, that guy was awesome. You know, like it was a good death. It was a, it was a time of remembrance and it was a lot of healing. We didn't even have to talk about, you know, the gunfights we've been in or anything. It wasn't even like that because we all knew that we had been through hell. We just wanted to like talk about good times, you know, and just be with each other, not dwell on that because we. That's every other day of the deployment. That was like our vacation. What had happened in that deployment and with all the death and carnage that was going on, there was like a little glimpse of, oh yeah, this is why I'm here, this guy. These are my brothers, you know, this is, this is it for sure. It was, you know, those brothers will always mean a lot. Forever. That's a bond that'll never go away. You know.
stories throughout deployment. I mean, we have endless stories, you know. It's just, what, what kind do you want to hear? You know, you want to hear funny, sad, you know, crazy. Like, like it was every day, it was, every day is a story, you know. It's your first night back in the United States, and you get ready to sleep. What's going through your head then? <laughs> get hammered drunk, <laughs> to be honest with you. You know, like party. Like, and we did. Yeah, we did. You know, I mean, obviously, like any other Marine come back from deployment, you just drink, you know, to make up for lost times. You know, and I just tell myself, oh, I'm just celebrating like anybody should. But, I mean, after a while, yeah, I realize, like, hey, celebration has to stop at some point, you know. You know, party's got to end at some point. When I first got back, I was, like, obviously really angry with everyone, anybody. Um, I was alone, like, depressed. Coming back from a deployment like that, you feel, I mean, we did, we accomplished something very big over there, you know? We did something very important. You choose to live this lifestyle of, of learning how to um, kill and survive and protect, you know, all at the same time, you know? And when you come back and you get out into the civilian lifestyle and you're making minimum wage, you know, you're not even doing anything, you just sit at home and... Learning how to um, be tough, like push through pain, go on so ever many mile humps with like a ruck and a backpack, you know, with all that weight and just toughing it out, the weather and the cold. You feel like you're like, wow, dude, I used to be like this I used to be a Marine, like fighting wars and defending my country and everything, and now I'm... I'm a sales rep at T-Mobile, <laughs> you know? And I'm selling phones to people. Um, you just feel like, why am I here? You know, and no one can relate to you. You try to find help, you can't. You're just like, dude, like just after a while, it's gone, so it gets with you, you're just like... We're bred to be these big, tough creatures and then all of a sudden you you know you, your mind starts going to these dark places and all of a sudden like whoa what what's going on here there would be random times when you just for no reason at all just start thinking about it like you could be doing like the fun like you just be like golfing or you know doing something really fun and all of a sudden you're just like why am i thinking about all these depressing things like why are they in my mind right now you know like it's like there's no reason for me to think about this and uh I don't know, I just continued, I mean, it still continues, it obviously goes away a little bit, but, I mean, it's always going to be there, there's nothing that's going to stop that. Because of, you know, who I am, I didn't want people to know that I was having those struggles or whatever, so I'd put on a face at work and act like everything's fine, you know, and I think a lot of us did, you know, try and just hide that we were actually having problems because I know personally, I used to like, be like, if I heard somebody had PTSD or I heard somebody was having a problem, I'd be like, he obviously isn't cut out for the job, you know? People told me going in, you're gonna come out a way different person. And I never thought, I always, I mean, I feel I'm a strong-minded person and not a lot of things can affect me mentally, but looking back at it now, I'm like, wow. And then so when I was struggling it myself, I was struggling with the things that I thought was weak, you know. In my mind, I was like, I shouldn't be struggling with this, you know, I'm, I'm a warrior, you know, I'm a, I'm a sniper, like, I shouldn't be struggling with this, you know. Um, so I tried to hide it. Um, so when you came back, were you ever diagnosed with PTSD? Or not? You know, I don't know, no one knows ever, like, you have PTSD, you know. PTSD is this definition that you just gets put at you and you're like, okay, well, I either feel like I do have this or I don't have it. And, and I think that 
it is absolutely wrong to say it's a disorder. Um, it's just, it's something that happened, you know. There's, there wasn't anything we could do about it. Do you think you have PTSD and like, what are your thoughts on all that? I mean, pretty damn sure I have PTSD. I know it's like kind of hard to diagnose, but I mean, I have flashes of depression and, you know, bad dreams and I think it's very, it's common in Marines, but I mean, the typical thing is that Marines don't want to admit it or whatever. And I totally agree with that. I don't want to, I don't want people to know that I have like a weakness, even though it's not a weakness, it's just something you have to deal with. So many people come back from war and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm fine, I'll deal with it, and it's not a big deal. And, you know, maybe some of them can. But, um, you know, I try to deal with it on my own for so long. Coming back, at first I, like, thought, you know, I had gone through the ringer and it was me that had all the problems. And then you look back and you got to think it all like the toll it took on your loved ones. You know, I saw what I was doing uh, to my family. And, you know, it was just like, I, I heard my mom say like, what, what can we do? And I realized that I was affecting the people around me. And that was when I was like, okay, you know, what, what steps do I need to take to change this? And that was, you know, a year, a year and a half after I got back. And then with my home life, you know, I felt like I couldn't talk to my wife or whatever. And I just felt like the only people I could talk to was like you guys and, and like my friends, you know, that I actually went with. And, so and then finally when... When I saw my dad, he just gave me a... <laughs> I mean, if I didn't move out to Michigan, if I would have stayed back in California and lived with my really close friends, I would have lived with them. It's still, when you need to talk to somebody, you need somebody that can relate to it. And there's just no one. Unless you've been through it, you can't relate to it. You know, she's still stuck it out with me and is faithful and and still, like, you know, is constantly doing stuff, cleaning the house and making sure that, you know, I have a good life. He just, he just gave me a beer. It's, it's like, welcome home, son. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today if she, was, if she wasn't here. My girlfriend, Amanda, she's helped me out a lot. She knows, like, she's seen the bad sides of me when I've had problems. It wouldn't, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would have been all right if, yeah. you, you know, if you weren't. And she stuck around and she calmed me down and talked with me and helped me through things. So, I mean, I gotta, like, I gotta thank her so much for that. And it, and it sucks too, because, I mean, we know some people that aren't in the same situation as us and we see the struggles that they go through. Yeah. So we know it's working. One, She's like me. Let's two, see. Yeah. Three, four, <laughs> five, six. I think that was the biggest realization with my family is realizing the importance of them, you know. Two, three. You're such a muscle four, girl. Five, six. Good job. Seven. Go to ten. Eight. And when I came back, I was like, oh, yeah. I was one who went through all this shit, and it just came back, like Christmas this year, it was when I first realized, it was like, this had an emotional toll on everybody that's close to me, it wasn't just me, you know, and like, 
It took me a year and a half to realize that. Throughout this film, I questioned whether I was doing the right thing. Asking my brothers to relive those moments, to delve back into that pain, has been a trying task. But now I understand. We owe it to the 25 who didn't come home, and every other warrior who has paid the ultimate sacrifice. We owe it to them to keep their memory alive, no matter how hard it is for us still walking this earth. We owe it to the fatherless children, to the wives who will never feel the touch of their husband again, to the girlfriends who keep that last letter in the top drawer of their bedroom dresser, to the brothers, sisters, and friends who would do anything to hear their laugh one more time. We owe it to the mothers who never stop praying, and to the fathers who buried their sons too early, and to the grandparents that watched them grow. We owe it to the ones who came home missing limbs and to the men who left their innocence on the battlefield. We owe it to the 25 to keep our brotherhood alive, to live our lives with their memory in our hearts, to help each other the way we did when death was a constant companion, and to make them proud because they will always be with us in spirit. Vanessa, say goodbye. Vanessa. Say goodbye. Say bye. Oh, she's actually in the sun. Say goodbye. Okay.